Good morning, Wayside family. How are we today? And it is great to be here. And we are going to do something we've not done in a while. We are going to welcome our parking lot people with us today. If you are here, give us a little honk to let us know you're out here. <laughs> well, we welcome them anyway. So. I know some models don't come with turn signals, so maybe they don't come with horns as well. But as you can see on, uh, by the look of the bulletin today, it is called A House Divided. For those of you who have already pointed out that I am wearing a blue and gold shirt today, have no fear. And I know I don't live as close to Huntington as I used to, but I do have some Kelly Green socks. <laughs> can um, attest to that. But I, Whitney, I do want to apologize. I left my Kelly Green Crocs at home that would have went perfect with this outfit today. So, I forgive you. You forgive me. That's good. That's good. Well, church, it is wonderful to be here this day. A um, couple announcements here in your bulletin. Don't forget, for the rest of this month and next month, we'll be taking up school supplies for local schools. Uh, there's a cute little bus down in the crossing where you can drop those off. Also, a uh, reminder for this month of August, Good Samaritan Center is in need of cake frosting. So keep those in mind as you go shopping throughout this, this coming week and the rest of this month for those needs that we can meet for those here in our community. The church, again, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and we want you to prepare yourselves for this time of worship. Lord of light and life, 
You have called us this day to open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, to hear your words of encouragement, healing, and hope. Give us patience and willingness to serve you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our opening hymn is number 578.
person's lives. Sometimes I wonder, I said to myself, I don't know how people kind of make it do the world without God, but, uh, but some do. And, uh, and in the end, it's kind of maybe, I don't want to be judgmental, but there's sort of a quality of an empty existence. Why should we use the big words with you guys? That's a big word that exists, but you like. Life. Now, let's see. Oh, this one here. This is the pool one. This is probably the one you're going to fight me for. <laughs> so, and uh, now people, yeah, in fact, this is pool. But what are, what are soda cans full of? So, yeah. <laughs> You've been paying attention to others. Well, it's like artificial sweeteners and stuff. And the people like this, they, they kind of put things in their lives that it's like sugar. It's, it's kind of feels good, but it just kind of leaves you wanting more and more. And uh, sometimes it's things just like shallow things like fame or cars and houses and boats and more fun and just more and more of things. And even though you have more, you just always want more. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Uh, now, uh, there's a story in the Bible. Jesus is at a well, and he meets this woman. She's called the Samaritan. Samaritan. Samaritan woman, I believe. Uh, the Samaritan. That's another story. <laughs>
final daughter goes to college. So I remember those days. Yes. <laughs> yes, do remember this time of transition, this time, this new season of life for those um, going through the same routine or starting a new routine in a new place. There are a lot of changes that, that happen this time of year. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, we got Jonah moved to WVU on yeah. Monday, and he went on his Adventure West Virginia backpacking trip and got back yesterday, right. and he had a good time, and he is raring to go, and awesome. it was a, a great experience, lots of fun moving him in, and he is happy as a clam. Oh. Right. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, Jensen will turn 17 on Wednesday oh, this week. Right. Which is also Jonah's first day of classes, and then you know, school starts Thursday, so yeah, this yeah. week. Yeah, yeah. Every week, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, you remember that as well. A lot of transitions happening. They will be on the, they will be teaching Sunday school today. Okay. Um, we have a sick dog. Aww. Remember the sick dog, and yeah, remember Dave. Mike? Uh, my dad and his wife, uh, Debbie, are, are celebrating their 29th Kentucky, I uh, saw also in uh, the town where the, the, my home church is and near Sissonville had some uh, flooding as well <clears throat> this past week, uh, not nearly to the extent as what Kentucky's been going through, but do remember all of those um, that have been devastated. Uh, remember our military as, as well. Jim Woody, he's, uh, he's now got pneumonia in the hospital. Um, so we're hoping he's going to pull that out of it. Can you remember Jim, who now has pneumonia in the hospital? Yes. Uh, yeah, my stepdad's in the hospital. He's a tank car. He, he fell. spoken concerns that are on our hearts this morning. The Lord knows each and every one of those. Let us uh, prepare our hearts as we go to Him in prayer at this time. Gracious God, we come before you this day giving you thanks for new life. Thanks for breath in our bodies, for the energy to come out and be here in this place to worship you. Lord, as we are mindful of the needs of our friends and family in our community, Lord, we come with celebration and request to watch over all of those children, staff, teachers, as they go back to school and start a new routine, be with the parents who have to sit back and wave from the bus stop or from the front door, or from a distance as some are off to college, away from home. 
Lord, that comes with good and it comes with bad, it comes with joy, it comes with concern. But knowing that we can come to you during this time, talk it out, that you hear us, that you're there with us to help us, whichever side we're on, where we know we are thankful for your presence in our lives and the lives of those we pray for this day. Lord, as those that have um, recovering from surgeries, recovering from falls, from illness, that continue to be in these hospitals, Lord, we uplift them to you this day and ask that you continue to watch over each and every one of them and also those that come in contact with them to help them along their journey. And Lord, may, may there be a way in which the love of God is shared in these conversations, in these times of care. May your love be ever-present in their lives. Lord, we ask you to be with Dave and, and his sick puppy this day. We ask you to be with those that are victims of flood and destruction. Those that don't know what their next day will look like. But Lord, you've empowered us to be your people, your hands and feet that can send items, can donate money, can be in prayer, can help those who help those in need from a distance. Lord, we are thankful that you have called us to be a part of a connectional church that can reach out further than just our front steps. Lord, for those unspoken concerns, we uplift them to you this day. And Lord, as we celebrate anniversaries and birthdays and new beginnings, we come with joyful hearts, with excitement, with thanksgiving, and with you in mind. And Lord, we ask that you continue to be with us during this service, during this time that we have set apart to worship you, to praise you, to read your word, to hear your word, and allow it to speak to us this morning. Lord, as we continue to praise with our time, we also continue to give you praise through our offerings as well. And Lord, as the church has gathered here, whether in the parking lot or at home, or from the road, through Facebook, or here in this sanctuary, we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples when he taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory
we offer ourselves into your nurturing hands. Receive the devotions of our labors, the fruits of our vines, and all that we are and know, that we may make a difference in our homes, in our communities, and in our world. Receive these sacrifices as a pledge to build our beliefs through Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my loved one a love song for his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it, cleared away its stones, planted it with excellent vines, built a tower inside it, and dug out a wine vat in it. He expected it to grow good grapes, but it grew rotten grapes. So now, you who live in Jerusalem, you people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I haven't done for it? When I expected it to grow good grapes, why did it grow rotten grapes? Now let me tell you what I'm doing to my vineyard. I'm removing its hedge so it will be destroyed. I'm breaking down its walls so it will be trampled. I'll turn it into a ruin. It won't be pruned or hoed, and thorns and thistles will grow up. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord of heavenly forces is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are the plantings in which God delighted. God expected justice, but there was bloodshed, righteousness, but there was a cry of distress. And the New Testament lesson from the book of Hebrews. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as if they were on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried it, they were drowned. By faith, Jericho's walls fell after the people marched around them for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute wasn't killed with the disobedient because she welcomed the spies in peace. What more can I say? I would run out of time if I told you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Through faith, they conquered kingdoms, brought about justice, realized promises, shut the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped from the edge of the sword, found strength in weakness, were mighty in war, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured and refused to be released so they could gain a better resurrection. But others experienced public shame by being taunted and whipped. They were even put in chains and in prison. They were stoned to death. They were cut in two when they died by being murdered with swords. They went around wearing the skins of sheep and ghost, goats, needy, oppressed, and mistreated. The world didn't deserve them. They wandered around in deserts, mountains, caves, and holes in the ground. All these people didn't receive what was promised, though they were given approval for their faith. God provided something better for us so they wouldn't be made perfect without us. So then, let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us since we have such a great sin, I'm sorry, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. 
Let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him, and sat down at the right side of God's throne. Hymn of invitation, if you can stand, please, is number 712. Sundays, as well as additional readings during feast days. 
During most of the years, the lections are a reading from the Hebrew Bible, a psalm, a reading from the epistle, and a gospel reading. The gospel readings for each year come from one of the synoptic gospels according to the following pattern. Year A is Matthew, year B is Mark, and year C in which we are in is Luke. Now I say all of that to say this, as some of these retired pastors are looking at me. Today's reading is not one that I would normally gravitate towards and choose to read and preach from. However, there are many reasons in which I like to follow the suggested calendar of readings. It's one to keep myself honest, to keep myself and my congregations protected by planning out well in advance. I learned that from a good friend and colleague, Gary Nelson, years ago. But also so that you wouldn't just hear me preach my favorite scripture every single week. So, let's get started today with Jesus bringing down fire and division, right? Reason one why I do not volunteer myself to do the children's sermon today. In today's gospel text, we can't help but pay attention to the casting fire that Jesus is talking about bringing upon the earth. This is the same Jesus that we sing about in December about bringing peace on earth and goodwill towards man. But here we have this same Jesus bringing fire and saying the exact opposite. Instead of peace, he's claiming division. So if we look at all the suggested readings for today in the Revised Common Lectionary, we see God dealing with some similar frustrations in Isaiah. And Kathy, thank you for reading those tough words that we just heard. You see, here we see God laying it out there and comparing how he had prepared for Israel, this vineyard that he expected to have a great harvest from. But instead of reaping those good grapes, those grapes he intended to use the wine press on, he got the opposite. You see, in Isaiah 5, 2, it says, He dug it, cleared away its stones, planted it with excellent vines, built a tower inside it, and dug out a wine vat in it. He expected to grow good grapes. But it grew rotten grapes. Rotten grapes. You see, when we fail to live the life that God has planned for us, we end up not only disappointing ourselves at times, but God as well. When he has done all the work, laid it all out there for us, he wants the best for us. And instead of good grapes, sometimes he finds the rotten grapes. So, of course, when there's rotten results, there's going to come some frustrations along with that disappointment. And that's what we see what's happening here with Jesus, too, reminding us that following him isn't always going to be well and good, but following him might cause some division along the way. It comes to the family matters that Jesus has been bringing up. We've been seeing how issues that come up often cause to family squabbles or fights. So it should come as no surprise that we are once again hearing Jesus mention about family differences. As he gets closer and closer to his time in Jerusalem, the importance becomes bolder and clearer to make. But in the past few weeks, we've seen the families arguing over how they spend their time with the Lord, with Martha and Mary, or whether we should disturb our family in the middle of the night when a friend comes in need. Or even the disgruntled brothers arguing over their inheritance and what portion they were going to get just a few weeks ago. This theme of there being division among family members, again, is nothing new. So in today's text, when Jesus says in verses 52 through 53, he says, From now on, a household of five will be divided. Again, he said, three against two, two against three. Goes on to even talk about mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. Something that I'm sure has carried on for many generations. It's no longer a shock to think that there will be division among our loved ones. Today. The following Christ isn't always about doing what's popular or what's acceptable or what's expected of you. And not every family has the same Christian values that you may have. And this reminds me of how insanely ignorant I was as a middle schooler. So I'm going to have a little story time here. I wasn't the brightest middle schooler out there. I thought I was going to handle middle school way better than my older brother and anybody for that matter. You see, back in the early 90s, our sixth grade class was the last sixth grade class to be in the elementary schools. 
as we were preparing to go into seventh grade, we were going to skip that awkward year of being low on the totem pole. And I thought, you know, I only have to deal with two years of middle school. This is going to be great. This is going to be the best time of my life. I was going to skip over that one year where you're going to get bullied and everything was going to be okay. Now, the reason I was so worried about the bullying aspect of life is our neighborhood was on a very small street just east of the middle school. And at the end of our street was a little cul-de-sac that had a little hill behind it that was a shortcut to the other side of cross lanes. So for those kids who didn't want to wait on the bus, they would come through our yard or our street to, to make their way home. Which also meant that our small, tiny neighborhood was the perfect place, out of eyesight from any teachers or faculty, to be the meeting spot for after-school bullies to meet their victims. As a little kid, I was terrified of all the fights that big issue that was going to continue when I got there. So to be able to skip that sixth grade year, I thought I would be in the clear. However, skipping through that awkward, those awkward years, come to find out it would be in eighth grade when I was bullied, and I was tripped in the hallway and broke my hip at the right age of 13. But you'll hear much more about that in another sermon, I'm sure. <laughs> but speaking of middle school, going back to how naive I really was, when I made it to the seventh grade, I became friends with a young man who had gone to a different elementary school. And my elementary school was right across the street from Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, where I grew up going to church. And through happenstances, or now looking back, probably careful parenting, I always seemed to hang out with the kids from my school that I also went to church with. So naive little me thought that everyone went to church. So when I went to spend the night with this new friend of mine, on a Saturday night, I was shocked that I got to do this thing that I had only seen about in movies and heard about, sleeping in on a Sunday morning. What in the world? I asked him, hey, Doug, are we going to church? And he just kind of looked at me funny. And it was right then in that moment that I knew that not everybody went to church. And I say that all of that to say this, that not every family has grown up going to church. So you're going to come across friends and family members and classmates and coworkers that didn't have the same upbringing as you and don't hold the same values that you do. And from time to time, when someone from one of those upbringings comes to know the Lord and start to change their lives and live their lives following after Christ, some division is going to happen in their own lives because their family is not used to those Christian values. And Jesus points to this and says that households, households will be divided. Now again, he mentions the in-laws, and mine were here just a couple weeks ago, so that's following God is not one of those struggles that we have. But I'm sure there are households out there that have experienced the Christian beliefs and the way of life being different from those that they live with and causing this division. But to look at his word and see that he has already called this out makes me want to ask, well, what did we expect? What did you expect? Would happen. Jesus has been telling us about this, this disputes and family issues for quite some time. You see, as he is traveling to Jerusalem this late in his ministry, he's been noticing this division. And as now we ask, what do you know? These followers of Jesus have been with him, have seen him perform miracles and do all these things, and yet they don't quite get it. So Jesus is at that point where he knows it is serious. He, know, he wants to know, what do you know? What are you paying attention to? What are the signs that you're seeing? You see, we have been through some division, experiencing ups and downs following Christ. But we aren't in that alone in that path. You see, in today's Hebrew text, it reminds us of those who had the faith and pursued before us. Now, it is a familiar text about running. And you'll hear this a lot from those who serve in maybe FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. You see, much like Jesus using parables, it's easy for us to relate familiar passages to those familiar athletic analogies. And one thing I will say, as someone who has tried over the years several times to enjoy and like running, my knees do not allow me to continue on in that. But I can't help but think of this one time early in our ministry. It was our first year serving church churches 
my wife and I decided to sign up for one of these 5K runs with some members of our congregation. You see, this text talks about this great cloud of witnesses when it comes to finishing this race. And me and my wife were wanting to finish that race together. We had started this journey of exercising and, and getting in shape and building up to doing this 5K. But the problem was this 5K that we did had its own cloud of witness as it was one of those collar runs. Have you guys ever heard of those where they throw the, the cornstarch collar at different places and you wear a white shirt and by the end of it it's multicolored and just terrible for breathing in while you're running? But what happened was during one of these first parts of the run, they blast you with this collar and we got separated from one another. And this whole time I thought I was being slow and I needed to catch up with my wife and she was just so far ahead of me that I ended up running a personal record and ran the fastest I've ever ran in my entire life. However, when I got to the, about a half, half a mile left in this journey, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I thought, you know, she's just going to have to finish this race without me. So I started to walk a little bit. And to my surprise, here she comes behind me. She was trying to catch up with me the whole time and wonder why I was leaving her in this colorful cloud of witness from this color run race that we did. But here I was feeling the worst for letting her down. And when she finally caught up to me, we did end up finishing that race together. Again, both probably having our personal record of the fastest time we've ever ran. Because she was behind me that whole time. But I think about those who ran the, or run the race with us and those who have ran the race before us. So in today's Hebrew text, it mentions all of those that, that came before us. Verse 29, it talks about those when they crossed the Red Sea. Verse 30, it talks about those that circled the walls of Jericho until they collapsed. And 31, about those who were obedient to the Holy Spirit that were saved from that destruction. And in 32, it goes on to mention all the others, such as Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, Paul, and so forth. All those who have come before us. In 12.1 it says, So then, with endurance, let's run the race that is laid out in front of us. Since we have such a great cloud of witness surrounding us, let's throw off any extra baggage and get rid of the sin that trips us up. So let's go forth and continue to run that race, knowing that division is still possible and out there, but that the finish line is where we will find the one, the pioneer, the perfecter in Jesus Christ. For he endured much more than what we've gone through. He endured our suffering, our pain, our humility with his death upon that cross. For his sake we have suffered some division, some persecution, but nothing compared to what he did for us. See all that extra baggage it talks about. Seems like some sour grapes to me. That need cutting loose from the things that don't bring forth the good fruit that our God expects and hopes for us. Not the sour grapes and bad fruit that get harvested from time to time. Things must be divided up, scorched from this earth with the fire of baptism that Jesus here is referring to. And much like that Advent hymn we sing about peace, we were also told of this fiery baptism from the forerunner John the Baptist before Jesus' time in ministry. Right earlier in Luke 3, verses 16 through 17, John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husk is in his hand. He will clean out the threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the husk with a fire that can't be put out. See, church, it's not all about unicorns and rainbows and all the happy, happy times when following Jesus. Yes, Jesus came to bring peace on earth and goodwill towards man. But he also came to bring justice and mercy as well. And with that justice... Sometimes causing division. And you can't tell a difference in the good fruit unless you know what is the bad and rotten fruit. See, he's the one who went before with fire like baptism, fire that cleanses, fire 
that restores and refines. He calls us to stay focused and read the room when it comes to things that are happening. To pay attention to the spiritual things in life, not just the weather. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And as much as he prepared his disciples and followers, they still couldn't sometimes read the room either. And didn't understand exactly what he was talking about. What was happening around them. Or even the seriousness of his upcoming death on the cross. Church, this is a reminder for us not to get so distracted and discouraged that we forget about the promise of his return. We talked last week about how God the Father has been a promise keeper all along. He didn't stop then, and he sure hasn't stopped now. God has promised us that return of his son, Jesus Christ. And much like Jesus here is trying to prepare his disciples, he's preparing us. Stay focused, to read the room, feel the Spirit, follow the Spirit. Let us pray, church. God, we have heard your word here this day. Sometimes it's hard to hear the words when they seem so harsh, with fire, with division. But knowing that your love and grace is all around it still. That you are reminding us to be focused, to pay attention to present times, to be mindful, to be ready for your return. And sometimes it takes that bold seriousness for us to understand what's going on. So the Lord, continue to speak to us, speak through us, and allow us to be focused on what's ahead through division, through family squabbles. Let us continue to run that race like those who went before us. In your name we give thanks this day. Amen. At this time, would you stand and join us in our closing hymn of Thanksgiving, number 706.